<coughs> okay, let's get started here. Um, so first off, turn off your cell phones. They tell me to say that. So please do it. I did mine. Um, was I supposed to say something else? I don't think so. Oh, by the way, um, this talk will be online pretty much right away, starting like Monday or something, so don't worry about taking little pictures. Um, and it'll be on the vault anyways, of course. A little plug for that. So let's talk about faces, since that's probably why you're here. I'm going to show you a movie. The movie will not have audio because my computer decided to break, like literally right now, and not display any audio. So I'm going to show you the movie and kind of talk over it. As we restart. Look at that dexterity. This is some uh, real-time facial animation demo that I've been working on, kind of on my own for a while. Um, it's a project that has been bugging me pretty much forever. Um, and so the trick is that um, I did some scans of this guy and then made some blend shapes and then animated it with traditional, standard, good old-fashioned motion capture data. And this runs in real time at like five milliseconds or so on my uh, 660 Ti back home. So that's basically what I'm talking about. This video will be online with audio on the GDC vault if you want to get audio. Okay, let's see if I can do this. All right. Okay, so we've all seen these really amazing looking raw scans. Um, and they're like surprisingly cheap and easy to get. Um, photogrammetry has gotten really good. And the thing is, how can we actually make you know, some kind of rig that artists can actually use that matches what these raw scans look like originally? We don't want to lose all this detail when we actually start driving it with uh, real data. And so the problem is, how do we you know, define a rig in this way? And the big disagreement that I have with uh, a lot of people is that it's not just the geometry. You really need those diffuse maps. So skipping ahead a little bit, um, here's the neutral pose and one of the you know, solved diffuse maps. And then you go to the smile, there's wrinkles, but there's a lot of stuff happening in here. If you look like right up here, like right above the nasolabial lobe, there's a little bit of redness that changes. Um, you can see in the stretch texture. You can see like the color of the wrinkles changes. So going between stretch and smile, the stretch has more like reddish wrinkles because the, um, the blood is pushed into the wrinkle, and so the area right behind the wrinkle is actually lighter than it should be, whereas in the stretch, it kind of goes the other way. And so there's all these little, tiny little things happening on the face that we're not accounting for. And my belief is that we, at some point we need to solve this problem. We need to really figure out what the face is doing and incorporate those details to get out of the uncanny valley. So I've believed this for a while. Um, we need to focus more on the spatial resolution, sorry, we need to focus less on the spatial resolution of the face and more on the temporal resolution of what's going on. Um, so that's basically the goal. We want to, of course, you know, get good geometry as well, but we also want to keep that diffuse color of the scans in the animatable data and drive this with good old-fashioned mocap. So my background is I did stuff at Georgia Tech that no one probably cares about. Um, then I worked in the Worldwide Viz Group on the uh, Tiger Woods demo back at E3 2006. Um, I worked on the canceled LMNO title. That was the last game that Spielberg worked on, and now he says games can't be art. Um, then I worked at Naughty Dog on Uncharted uh, 2 and 3 and other stuff. And then I've been doing contract work kind of uh, since then, mostly for uh, Microsoft. But this stuff is all kind of separate. So back when I was working on the uh, Playable UCAP project, it totally changed the way that um, I think about faces. So the idea behind the U Universal Capture project is you capture everything. You know, you have one unique diffuse map for every single frame of animation. It's kind of the same thing as L.A. Noir, except they use markers and other stuff. But the thing about it is that um, the geometry was just plain old joint geometry. You can look at the old videos. So if you have plain old, old uh, joint geometry, your animation will probably not look that great. This is well established. But if you, you use the exact same geometry, but you also animate the diffuse map, it looks amazing. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to animate the diffuse map. That's what we fundamentally need to solve, in my opinion. Also, what's really sad is that in the Tiger Woods project, they never showed the raw, uncompressed data. What was shown was always the uh, compressed um, stuff that had a lot missing. And so there is this great data set on a server at EA somewhere that absolutely proves this conclusively, and I just don't have access to it, which I admit is completely lame, but it's what it is. So the other paper that came out a few years later was the, uh, this uh, 
great academic title for a paper, uh, Facial Performance Synthesis Using Deformation-Driven Polynomial Displacement Maps. Um, they animated faces. It was a really cool ICT paper where they had this guy make a whole bunch of uh, 40 captures that were really short, like a really short angry expression, a happy expression, a sad, etc. And they captured the geometry, displacement, and diffuse um, color per frame. So I can flip between two of them, but they of course have the whole movie file. And the cool idea behind it was that you can then take these dots and synthesize a new expression from it. Um, using the position of the dots, you can figure out where you are in those initial poses and in theory get really high quality data. And so it's a very different approach from the Universal Capture Project. In the Universal Capture Project, you say, okay, you want a very large quantity of very high quality data, which is just not really practical. Whereas in this paper, they said, okay, we'll take a small quantity of really high quality data, and then we will use low quality motion capture data to figure out how to drive that. Um, so that's what sort of motivated me to think along these lines. Somehow, some way, there must be a way that we can capture a small quantity of high quality data and drive it with good old fashioned markers. So another cool paper that I saw was this one. Um, uh, basically what they did is they did a bunch of raw scans of a face and then they aligned them all mostly automatically and then drove it using standard motion capture data. Um, uh, you've also probably already seen the Digital IRA project. If you haven't, then please Google it and watch it because you should look at it. Um, they, it was done by ICT and of course other people doing the rendering. Um, but they use the same process where you have a few high quality scans and then you sort of drive it with data. The other cool thing is that um, EdgySoft PhotoScan is kind of really kicking ass right now. Um, it's a really good piece of software, it's really cheap, and you can get really incredible quality scans using standard SLRs. So you have these really great scans from Infinite Realities. So that's sort of what led me to lead to, uh, to this approach. The idea that you can scan an actor process those raw scans into some kind of aligned blend shapes, compress that data in real time, and then drive those blend shapes with mocap and do all the usual kind of standard uh, rendering stuff. So scanning. Scanning is much easier than it used to be. So for this one, I did uh, a scan with Infinite Realities, founded by Lee Perry Smith. Uh, he has a really good facial setup with uh, 48 cameras. Um, he also has a 150 camera setup for the full, for, uh, full body scans, and he keeps buying more cameras. I think he said he wants 200. Um, you've probably seen him. This isn't Lee. This is a render of Lee. He decided, he, was, he very generously scanned his head, cleaned it up, and made it available to the graphics community to use as a test head on things. So we all kind of owe him for that. So the main advantage of photogrammetry is instant capture. If you do these kind of scans where you uh, uh, you know, you two have, you like a little turntable or you need the actor to hold the expression for like a few seconds, people are always moving. And so you always have a huge amount of cleanup due to just the misalignment of people um, subtly moving. And the really cool thing about photogrammetry is that it's captured instantly. You essentially uh, have all your cameras shoot for like a quarter second or something, and then you do, you do that in a dark room and you sync with light with a flash. So everything is nice and perfectly aligned. Also, you can get um, most of the fine wrinkles in the face. You can't get pore level, but you can capture the, the folds. Um, yeah, so that's the main drawback, is you don't get those fine wrinkles. Um, if you do something like a light dome scan, you're, you get these incredible, like, detailed uh, normals, but you don't get that from photogrammetry. And also you get some uh, lighting baked in, but that's life. And so in this case, um, I did a uh, shoot with 70 expressions, solved in PhotoScan to uh, 7.5 million polys. Uh, they're also really great resolution. So we has 48 cameras. Um, each camera is like 5K. And so you can zoom in, and you can keep zooming in, and each individual pore is like five pixels wide. So let's talk about actually doing something with this data now that we, in theory, have it. So look at this later. Sorry, you missed it. Uh, so the first thing you have to do, of course, is retopologize a mesh. So um, I had uh, this sort of generic retopologized mesh made with 4,800 verts. It's not low, but it's not exactly high either. 
Um, games are shipping with higher counts than that. I um, also had a standard joint rig made. There's 150 joints, nothing really fancy. There's a few extra ones on the neck and uh, a few on the interior of the lips, but otherwise it's basically your good old standard boring joint rig. Also, I'm a believer in the sort of old school boring UV space. I'm not a fan of cutting up into tiny little pieces. And the trick is that um, it actually gives you perfect um, uh, stretch because you can only animate the middle of it. So basically cut out this little piece and only animate this section and also it gives you almost nearly perfect flattening as opposed to cutting up a whole bunch of pieces. Except for the ears, but whatever. Um, also, I believe in dots. Um, HP Diker, I owe a beer because he uh, convinced me that you, know, you can track without markers, but you really want to track with markers. Um, he uh, lived through hell on the Matrix sequels because he didn't do this and is very adamant that this is what you should do, and I completely agree. Um, if you have markers that you don't want, you can clean them up easily. Worst case scenario, you can, you can um, you know, do a healing brush in Photoshop. Um, if you don't have markers and you need them, you are screwed. So I highly recommend using markers and cleaning it. So the way that I actually tracked these markers was the worst way you could possibly do it. Um, I just sat down, opened Maya, and I placed the locators. It took me a while. Um, I didn't feel like dealing with the whole pipeline thing because different programs have different things for camera distortion coefficients and yada, 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 and Y is up. Um, so I just did the horrible way. It took me like a day or two. And so once you have these joints, you can implicitly create a nice little joint rig. Each of these colors is one of these little uh, locators. It's not the original joint rig, it's the uh, locators that I put on that face. And so we want to align this, you know, artist mesh to the face. And so one way we can do that is by adjusting the joints. So if we have one of our little uh, locator joints in, on the artist mesh, we can see where it should be on the, uh, on the actual scan, and then we can move the, the, the joint locator to that point, and then the mesh kind of follows along. Another rule is that obviously we want this um, artist mesh to match where the scan is in 3D space. So if we have our little artist mesh with these little points, um, and we have the actual scan from you know, the scan data in 3D, uh, we can find the nearest point on the scan for every single vertex and then um, sort of snap to it or get some delta closer to it. The third thing we can do is use Laplacian smoothing. So if we have a little vertex in the middle, um, it has these neighbors, uh, five in this case. Well, the average of those five neighbors is like this point right here, not to scale, don't have to calculate it. Um, but the difference between where a point is and the average of its neighbors is called the uh, Laplacian of a point. And so we can do this in a whole bunch of iterations. So at first you move the locators to match where they should be, uh, and, the, and the mesh follows along. Then you um, have every single uh, point on your artist mesh locked to the scan. And then you relax the mesh to try and keep it from smoothing, try to keep it from bunching up in places. And then you do this a whole bunch of times and a whole bunch of iterations, and eventually it kind of solves. And so on the left side, we have the, uh, uh, the solved bunch shape. And in the middle, you have the original scan. And the right side is the two overlaid with each other. The fact that they you know, have a lot of kind of noise in there means that they uh, fit pretty well. Okay, so that's half the problem. Um, that's how we can sort of get our blend shapes mostly aligned, but now we can, of course, project um, our textures. But they look kind of like this. <clears throat> so that looks kind of okay. Here's the here's a three going back and forth. And at a glance, it looks like they're pretty well aligned, but they're actually not. Uh, if you look very closely at like the eyebrows, you can see that there's a lot of little movement in there. And then if you zoom in on, say, like the area right around here, um, there's a lot of wobbling. It's going to be very hard to compress this data in a meaningful way without sort of losing it because you really need to get all this data to align. So now we get to talk a little bit about optical flow. So optical flow is the process of finding a correspondence between two images. And so what this paper did, which was really cool, is they calculated the curvature for every single one of these poses. And the idea is that 
the curvature should be in the same place in different poses. And so then you can use optical flow on this data and get the scans to mostly align. Um, the digital IRF project used a similar concept, except they used optical flow on the diffuse map. They have all these diffuse maps, and then they used optical flow to try to make everything align with the neutral pore by pore. So that's basically what we're going to do. Um, the one problem is that we can't actually, like, solve the neutral to the eyebrow up because those wrinkles won't be in the neutral expression. So what you do is you want to find similar scans that have the similar, um, uh, similar curvature and then use optical flow for those and then also try to include the neutral expression when you can. The neutral expression is the only one that doesn't change. So um, the trick is that you can then have these expressions solved to each other. Um, in theory, they should all converge to the neutral expression. In reality, they won't, but they'll at least be pretty close to each other and it minimizes the amount of swimming across the textures. Um, so I exported curvature maps like these. Um, this is curvature, go figure. Um, you also need to do some noise reduction to remove the, the minor details. You only want the big global details in the curvature. And the other problem, this is kind of hard to see, but I did a um, high frequency sort of pass on this. With photogrammetry scans, you can't use optical flow the same way that ICT does, because if you have a light dome, you have nice, perfectly ambient lighting, and you can use that to solve. However, with photogrammetry, you have some lighting baked into it. So if you imagine, like, a point right here on your face, and you go like this, then it's normal changes, and it gets different lighting, and it's impossible to actually match it um, with optical flow. It'll match the wrong value. So what you want to do is extract the high-frequency data so that you're actually using optical flow on the natural markers of the face as opposed to the baked-in lighting. So that's basically the idea. Um, for every single pose, you want to use optical flow to make it um, align with its five sort of nearest poses, as well as the neutral, and then take the median. Taking the median has a really nice property that if a few of the optical flow solves are really bad, they'll just throw it away and take the best one in the middle. And so you do this in a whole bunch of iterations. So you take each pose, find, use optical flow to find the nearest correspondence, do that for curvature, do that for diffuse, and repeat. Um, also, you don't really use it for the eyes. It's, there's too much stuff from, like, the eyelids. Um, and you ignore the back of the head, of course, and that kind of thing. So before is on the left, and the after is on the right. And so I can show you that. It doesn't look very different. But it's actually pretty major when you get down to it. So looking at the eyebrows, you can see much more movement in the original than the after ones. But then looking at this uh, little zoom right here, uh, left and right, of course, on the left you see lots of wiggling, but whereas on the soft scan, it's mostly localized. So it's a subtle effect when you look at it. But the difference in quality is absolutely gigantic when you want to compress this data later. Uh, the less motion you have, the better your data will compress. So you still need a normal map. So I wrote a custom normal map transfer function. I didn't feel like dealing with going back and forth with Maya, although Beast has a, sorry, Turtle has a really good one. Um, and I also had to run some image space noise reduction to get rid of some of the noise in the scans. Also, I'm a big fan of AO. So I baked AO and used it as a specular mask. Go figure. And that's it. That's how you create fun shapes. Um, I did all the processing in 2K and then extracted the 1K maps in the middle from anim for animation. Um, I have solved some 8K maps, but that's kind of a pain to actually process with one machine. And the big thing is that it's a mostly automatic process. You know, you need a few days to align the markers. And then, in theory, it mostly aligns. You may have to fix the lips and some stuff, but it's much better than having a whole bunch of really expensive, talented artists spending all their time, like, fiddly fixing up scans. So I'm going to show you... No, not yet. Sorry. I lied. So compression, decompression. So we have 70 blend shapes, and each of these blend shapes has a diffuse map, a normal map, and an AO map. Um, compressing the shapes is kind of a, a well-solved problem. Compressing the textures, we don't really have a solution for. So this is very similar to the uh, universal capture problem that I worked on back in the day. Um, 
you know, every single frame of animation had a unique diffuse map. And so we had to compress that in some way. And you just run PCA and you solve the whole thing. Well, this is kind of the same problem, whereas Tiger Woods had like 5,600 unique frames or so. Um, we only have about 70, so it should compress pretty well. We had major compression issues with Tiger Woods. Um, now that I've looked at the problem more, I realized all these things that we did wrong, but um, we should be able to compress these 70 textures pretty well. So also, we're not going to actually compress the texture, we're going to compress the offset from the neutral. Um, so we're gonna take a smile, subtract out the, the uh, well, I just realized that my pointer is on my screen, not on your screen, sorry. Wow. So I'm pointing at things that you don't see. Ah, this is why I need to rehearse properly. Um, okay. So anyways, you get the little de detail right here. Okay, so the basic idea behind PCA is you take the neutral expression and then you apply some weights to your um, component vectors. So you're basically saying that, um, you know, the neutral texture plus some constant times this texture plus some constant times this texture, yada, 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 eventually equals this one right here. However, by just changing the, uh, uh, the weights of it and changing the shader constants, you can animate to different expressions. And so it's really nice. It works well on the GPU because it's a bunch of textures and dot products. Um, it works pretty well. So the way you could calculate this is uh, using the SVD. So the SVD will essentially, every single one of these grayscale maps is a column. And so if you have three channels times 70 textures, that's 210 columns. And so you can use the SVD, find your eigenvectors, chop off all but the first 12, and you're done. I really recommend you don't do that. Um, we did this on Tiger Woods and it was a nightmare. Um, we had like one dedicated machine with a lot of RAM and we had to run overnight for like eight hours. And then like what do you do if it crashes at the end? I mean, uh, we had those kinds of issues. Um, yeah, don't do that. Instead what you should do is just calculate your PCA component vectors or your eigenvectors using the uh, iterative power method which is relatively simple. In theory, the SVD will give you better stability for a large number of components. So if you're doing an engineering problem and you're solving millions of eigenvectors, then go ahead and use the SVD. But if you need like 12, you're not going to have any major precision issues as long as you're a little careful with your dot products. So go to Wikipedia, find the algorithm, do it. It's pretty simple. It's a, where's my pointer? There it is, it's just that. Um, and then we can calculate these eigenvectors, but we run into a problem with it. So the problem is that we can only use the whole image. If you're applying one weight to the entire image, it's hard to get the things that you actually want out of each individual um, image. So let's say that we have this little stretch texture here. And the stretch texture really likes these, you know, it, it needs these uh, wrinkles at the top, and it also needs uh, these wrinkles at the bottom, which are in the component texture. So, okay, that's great, we want this texture. However, for like the factual two, the eyebrow razor, um, we don't really want the stuff under the chin. We don't, we don't want that stuff. We want to only take the stuff on top, but not the stuff on bottom. But if we use PCA, we'll get like halfway in between and then need more corrections uh, later. A similar one is fax 27. So we want the stuff under the chin, but we don't want the uh, eyebrow wrinkles. I mean, it's pretty obvious for anyone who's ever worked on faces, the wrinkles in different areas and the blood flow is independent um, of the other areas. So the solution to this is we don't want to take the whole image, we want to take pieces of these little uh, PCA eigenvectors. And we can do that by basically using a weights texture. So I made this sort of map manually, very poorly I might add, in Photoshop. But you break the, uh, the head into eight different regions and you essentially want to use those regions separately, and it greatly helps your uh, compression. So you take your PCA vector, you know, your, M, your grayscale image, and you multiply it by the different uh, regions. So you, know, you have like your, this is the left side of the mouth, this is the right side of the mouth, and then that's like under the chin. <clears throat> so in theory, if you're using PCA, you use the dot product. If you say, I want to have this single vector on the left, and I want to choose the weight that gets it as close as possible to my original image. Well, instead what you can do is think of it as a least squares problem. You have eight different um, images 
because of the eight different regions, and you want to choose the weights of those regions such that it gets you as close as possible to your original image. And in practice, what happens is it means that, this that the stretch texture can decide, okay, I want this entire region under the neck. But the eyebrow razor is allowed to say that I don't want that region, but it can still take the other areas. And similarly for the FAX27, you can also keep that region. So the trick is that it allows each of the different expressions to only take the areas of the component vectors that it wants, which leads to um, compression that gives you much better ratios, especially for small numbers of vectors. Um, over the long term, if you are compressing like thousands of eigenvectors, it eventually kind of converges and doesn't make a huge difference. But if you're doing, I don't know, a video game where you want to have as few components as possible, um, doing weights really helps. So here's the final um, results before and after compression. So before is on the left, after is on the right. And we can see that it's pretty decent for the eyebrow razor. Um, for the smile, it's pretty good. There's a little bit of softening um, right by the uh, like main wrinkles, which you probably can't see. Um, same for uh, this one here. And then also the uh, um, compressed texture. You can see it's losing a little bit of that coloration in the, um, uh, sort of right up on the, right here. But it's pretty good, all things considered. So with PCA, you are going to lose some detail, um, but it could be a whole lot worse. Um, if there's texture swimming, you lose a lot of detail really fast, so it's very important to have really good localized diffuse maps if you want to use PCA to compress it. Uh, here's a shader, look at it later. Sorry. Uh, also remember, I'm using old school UVs. Um, they're flattened UVs optimized for the sort of entire face, and the middle is pretty small, but how big the face is in the original map doesn't actually matter because we're only going, we're still going to isolate that region and use a 1K region specifically for that and only animate that section. And so the trick is we can um, sort of encode the, um, the, the blurriness from downsampling into the PCA vectors. And so you can sort of compensate for the lower res uh, original images and it's mathematically the same thing. And so the cool thing is that, um, so this left image over here is, you know, it's, it's actually 1K. It's the 2K map downsampled into 1K. Um, these component maps are all 1K, but only have just the region in the middle of the face. So what happens is you can compress all 70 of these maps down into the size of the equivalent of a single 2K map. Um, I'm also compress the normal and ambient occlusion uh, the actual, I used 512 for them. I didn't deal with uh, detail normals, but maybe someday. Um, oh, yeah, I did AO2. Yeah. And so for all this data, if you uh, use BC7 compression, it's all in for uh, all this PCA stuff, 8.7 megabytes. It's not, it actually fits in a reasonable size that we can actually use in games. Um, okay. One other thing is that um, I feel like we could use PCA for a lot of other things. So... Um, the X, Y, and Z channels of a normal map usually have really good coherency. So if you're doing like the standard approach where you have, you know, a neutral texture, a compressed texture, and a stretch texture, you can probably compress them all with PCA and make it a lot smaller. Um, it's, PCA is pretty great. Um, you can easily blend things out. So for LOD, all you have to do is just zero out the weights and switch to the uh, neutral only. Um, you can scale the quality if you want more than 12 or less than 12. It's an arbitrary number that I picked. Um, you get free mit mapping. You see all these academic papers where it's a great algorithm for, de for compressing images. And then it's like linear sampling requires like 12 extra instructions. Um, I remember that Clint Hansen back at EA had a really good example of water at, in 2006 that he never actually showed, I don't think, where you do this really high quality VFX, you know, solve, and then compress it all with PCA. It never really made sense on previous gen consoles because um, DXT1 is kind of useless for uh, PCA because you get too many blocking artifacts. But with BC7, we can actually do this and get pretty good ratios. Another problem that I've been thinking about for years is uh, baked light maps for time of day. If you have dynamic time of day, it's generally assumed that you can't bake light maps because it's too much data. In theory, you could bake out every time of day and then compress it. So that's blending. Here's some of the uh, 
raw blend shapes. And I can try and do a video again. This one doesn't have audio, so it's actually the same. Okay, so there we go. No, restart. There we go. So here's some of the blend shapes just kind of blending away. You can see there's a lot of data happening in the diffuse map, which is the thing that I've been playing about for years. You also have stuff in the normal and AO map. And of course, there's no tongue or lips, so some of those look kind of strange. So that's cool, but now how do we actually drive this using good old fashioned motion capture data? So to recap, we have all these blend shapes, you know, Fax 24, 33, compress, smile, surprise, etc. And we have a bunch of frames of animation. So you just call the motion capture studio, they give them your sort of joint rig and they solve it and voila, you get joint data. Um, and we have a problem because the blend shapes are fundamentally defined by movements of vertices whereas the animation is defined by the movements of joints. So we need to put these two into the same space, and the easiest way to do that is to um, figure out the joint movement that best corresponds to each individual blend shape. Um, and so then the theory is that given these sort of joint shapes, we want to find the weights of these joint shapes that matches the actual animation. Then we can reuse those weights, apply them to the original blend shapes, and it should look right, hopefully. So let's go through a simple example. Let's say you have like a joint on your eye. So you have, sorry, not on the eye, on the eyebrow. So okay, so you have one blend shape that goes straight up. And you have another uh, joint shape that goes up and to the right. And we want to get to this point right here. Well, I'll solve our, so if we use least squares and solve it, it will say, hey, if we set both of these shape weights to one, then we get right there. That's really cool. So that's nice. Um, let's try another case. So in this case, we have, you know, one shape has the eyebrow going straight up. Uh, another shape has the eyebrow going up and to the right as well. But the motion capture data is only a slight movement to the right. So if you compress this with uh, least squares, it's going to say, hey, I found a perfect solution for you. you know, if we have, you know, all of one shape and then negative of the other shape, we get the perfect exact value. Isn't, isn't this awesome? And so the thing is, we don't actually want to match the joint positions. We only want to match the joint positions if there's a reasonable way we can get there using, you know, intuitive parameters. So a pretty obvious constraint for our, you know, our solver is that we really don't want to have um, negative weights. Um, our matrix is over-constrained. Also, in, in the general solution of least squares, every single value will be non-zero, generally speaking. Um, there's exceptions, but that's what will usually happen with a good um, real data. And, you know, we can't do a negative eyebrow up. If we want to do eyebrow down, that's great, but we don't want to use a negative eyebrow up to get there. Um, and so the simple uh, solution to this is to use non-negative least squares. It is exactly what it says it is. It is least squares where you don't allow non-negative values of your weights. So getting back to this example, if we use non-negative least squares, then um, our solver will say that we actually can't use any of these weights at all, which is actually a really good thing. Um, obviously, we want to find weights that match our joints, but it's actually more important to not use the wrong joints because that just causes trouble later. Figuring out, figuring out which shapes not to use is just as important as which ones to use. In fact, sparsity is a very important thing to have. So here's another case. So we have our one joint that goes up again, another um, pose where it goes up and to the right, and we're going to the same spot, but we also have a tiny little vector that moves slightly to the right. So our solver is gonna say, hey, we can just make that a blend shape weight of 10, and we will be right there, and it's perfect. Uh, which of course isn't what we want as well. So a very common um, solution to this is to say that your weights um, have to be between zero and 1.0, or maybe like 1.5 if you know, the mocap might go a little farther than your original poses. 
Um, so you can use a proper range solver or you can just clamp at the end. For the um, non-negative portion, you have to use a non-negative solver. But for the ones that go too high, you can just clamp it if you want to. And that's what I did. So in this case, we would say that we don't want the green one to have a weight of 10. We'll make a, a weight of one. And we, and we won't actually get there, but that's okay. That is the least worst thing we can do. So here's the really interesting case. So now we have an eyebrow up that goes straight up. We have, say, an eyebrow down pose that goes down and to the right. And we want to move slightly to the right. Well, our solver will say that, okay, we want both the eyebrow up and the eyebrow down. Because when they fight against each other, they converge to the exact value that we want. But that's not really good. We don't really want those blend shapes fighting each other. And so the standard solution to this is to add another um, constraint to your solver. So you would say that your eyebrow up and your eyebrow down can't go together. You, you can either have one or the other, but not both. That's one way to do it, but the problem is that there's so many combinations you have to deal with. Like, think about um, all the different jaw expressions and all the different smiles and variations of smiles. It's really hard to explicitly define a graph that says what you do and don't want. So I did not do this. Instead, I changed the math. So the trick is that instead of thinking of a joint as a three-component vector of x, y, and z, you split the positive and negative. So positive x minus x, positive y minus y, positive z and minus z, and this solves a lot of your problems. So getting back to this case, um, this initial vector, 0, 5, 0, would turn into 0, 0, 5, 0, 0, 0. Uh, the second vector would turn into 1, 0, 0, 0, 5, 0, 0. And what's interesting about this mathematically is that these initial vectors have a very strong negative covariance. Whereas if whereas in the adjusted six component vectors, they actually have no covariance. They're no longer related to each other. Uh, but the trick is that also when we solve these joints, they will also split that as well. So what happens is that the joints, the, the poses that go in the wrong direction simply have no covariance with the um, position you're trying to get to and it ends up being zero, which is what you want. And so it, we find that our initial choice of one for both weights is, you know, much, uh, uh, is very off because those two fives don't cancel each other out. And we decide that the best solution is to not move either, um, not use either pose at all, which is actually good. So each shape has 150 joints and each joint has six channels. So you can think of each individual pose as a 900 channel vector. So if you have 70 poses, that's a, um, a matrix with 900 rows and 70 columns that you can solve with non-negative least squares and then chop off your blend shapes that are too high. Um, also, uh, I used the same um, joint mask as well as I did for PCA. So you actually run this whole thing eight times on each different uh, region. So I'm going to show you one more video. Um, one second. Okay, this is a comparison between the actual motion capture actor and the solved uh, shape animation. It, it corresponds pretty well. Um, the areas where we captured a lot of data, like around the uh, nasal labial lobe, tends to work pretty well. I wish I had captured more like mid um, forehead up expressions. And this is just the raw data solved automatically with no artist cleanup at all. So I'm pretty happy with it given that. The one cheat is that I had to use the uh, mocap solved joint animation for the lips and for the eyes because it gets too, you get fish mouth if you try to solve it in the lips. So you can look at this uh, later on GDC Vault. One more plug for you. Okay. So now let's talk about some random rendering stuff. Um, that's the best as I can describe it. So we have this triangle mesh. We have this decompressed, you know, diffuse map, normal map, and AO. So now what do we do? Um, so I'll talk about a few different things. Um, we've all hopefully seen the NVIDIA um, skin shading. If you haven't, you really should have seen that before coming in here. Um, it's pretty good. So my primary goal is to make it cheaper while keeping the quality as close as possible. So the idea of the NVIDIA skin paper is that you sort of figure out the diffusion profile of, you know, skin, and then you actually do this blur. So in theory, it's five Gaussians, 
so, which are separable, so they're fast, because separable things are fast. But no matter what you're doing, if it takes uh, 10 passes to do something, it's probably a little too slow on the consoles. So I had a discussion with Morton Mickelson way back in like 07, 08, 08. Um, and we both kind of agreed that it's a blur and a spike. If you actually look at this profile, um, you know, you have this bright spot in the middle, and then you have this kind of blur. Um, getting the exact shape of like how this yellow slightly shades into red, like who cares? If it's not exactly perfect, you won't really be able to see it. Um, also, and this was also, um, should, uh, Nicholas Schultz had from Crytek had a talk two days ago where they kind of had the same conclusion and you should go see the talk, it's really good, on GDC Vault. Um, <laughs> So that's the basic idea. We're going to render to a light map, and I'm going to say, you know what, let's just do this as one blur. I don't care. Um, we'll render to a light map, we'll blur it vertically, we'll blur it horizontally, and then that's it, and I'm done. Um, so it kind of works. Um, so this is a 1080p uh, render, and the question is, um, how, how big does your light map actually need to be? And so in this case, it was 256 squared. So it's about that big. So one thing that um, often gets lost in the discussion when debating between screen space and texture space is that you can get away with a much smaller resolution um, in texture space than you can in screen space, generally speaking. Um, there are certain cases where texture space is better and screen space is better, but the thing is, it's a blur. It doesn't need high frequency information. So we can get away with smaller resolution than the um, initial screen space size. There's also a way that we can approximate this very quickly uh, in one pass. So the theory says that we have this top row in our sort of Gaussian uh, solve to the diffusion profile. And we have this little, uh, this little joint right here. And then what the profile says is that that top row is how much light is taken from that little joint. And then we have all these nearby joints that also get some light. And the diffusion profile says that we want to get different amounts of light from the nearby, uh, uh, nearby spots. But the trick is that skin is very, very bumpy, and these bumps tend to even out. It's not perfect, but over the space of a few millimeters, you will have basically an even distribution of normals. And so the trick is that we can assume that all these samples actually point in the direction of the geometry normal. So that's what we can do. We can say the um, the top row of lighting comes from the normal map to normal, and everything else comes from the geometry normal. And that's what the uh, code looks like. Basically, you have your normal map to normal, your geometry normal, you calculate your diffused light twice, and then you just lerp based on your color ratio. It's very easy to do if you're forward. I don't know how you would do it if you're divert. So let's uh, compare the two. So here is the you know, full texture space blur. Uh, here it is with the one pass approximation. Um, it's certainly not quite as good as the light map blur, but it's certainly acceptable. Um, but if we compare the, you know, the lerp trick to the raw Lambert, it's like, ah, it's hideous. Uh, it has that granite look that uh, skin is known to have. So, um, but the, the thing is, it's different when you actually have real lights. Having a single light on a fully black, um, you know, ambient is very different from a more ambient situation. So here is the uh, texture blur approximation, or the texture blur um, render. And then with the one pass approximation, it doesn't actually look that different. Um, you can see some differences, especially around the ears, but overall it doesn't like, fall apart very quickly. Whereas the Lambert one still kind of looks pretty bad. It's easier to see also when it's in motion and you have light on it. Um, but the thing is, um, once you get far away, it really just doesn't matter. Um, here's the comparison. I don't see any real difference between these. So that's a few th one thing to consider. If you have really harsh lighting, you need more accurate subsurface scattering than you have flat lighting. So these tests where you'll see someone have like a bright white light on a black ambient isn't really valid for evaluating subsurface scattering. You need some sort of um, ambient term that is reasonably close to what your you know, game will have to evaluate which solution is best. Also. Faraway characters don't need subsurface scattering. You know, one thing I hear is that, well, with texture space, subsurface scattering, you, how would you handle an army of you know, guys that are like 300 fighting naked? Like, you don't care. It doesn't matter because 
the blur is only like two millimeters wide anyways. So once things get far away, the size of that blur is less than a pixel. So there's no point in applying subsurface scattering to it. Uh, let's talk about powdered donuts for a second. Um, we'll change the pace. So I was working on Uncharted 2, and Evan Wells comes up to me and says something to the effect of, it's an emergency. Uh, Drake looks like he ate a powdered donut. Um, we had a really funny conversation while I was trying to figure this out. And eventually I figured out that it was a situation kind of like this, where you have a light sort of behind the head, and you can see that due to the fact that there's no shadowing, you have this sort of like, the light kind of bleeds through into these little, you know, parts of the face, and it looks kind of like a powdered donut on his lips. Um, so the solution to this is to apply shadow. Done. Problem solved. You know, all I have to do is just apply shadows everywhere we see this, and then the problem goes away. And it's next gen, which is really fast, so we can afford 1080p, 60 FPS with 10 shadows on every character, right? Um, but of course, we can't, you know, actually do this. So one trick is to use a spherical harmonic ambient occlusion. Um, it's basically what it says it is. It's like ambient occlusion with spherical harmonics. The trick is for every vertex on the head, you figure out um, where the lighting can come from uh, legally and store that in spherical harmonics. You do this by casting small little ambient occlusion rays offline. And so here's the original guy with uh, no, um, no shadowing of any kind. And then with uh, spherical harmonic ambient occlusion, it looks a lot better. It's certainly not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was. Um, it's not as good as a true shadow, but you know, it's much cheaper, don't need to pass. Now here's another comparison. So there's no shadow at all. You can see the issues on the eyes and nostrils and yada, yada, yada. And then spherical harmonic ambient occlusion solves most of it, except for that little, uh, there's a little spot in the eye. If the black levels were a little better, you could see it, but there is actually uh, like a little bit of light right there on my screen. Um, but the shadow actually removes it. Um, so let's look at some full renders. So in this case, um, so all those videos I showed were four lights, but with only one of those lights casting a shadow. The other three only occluded using spherical harmonic ambient occlusion. So if you turn everything off, we get those, that really annoying ear artifact. We have those little lights that come from the uh, shadowing, you know, the fill lights behind it. Um, Spherical harmonic ambient occlusion will tend to solve this problem for you. It can ease the ambient occlusion, says that light can't come from that direction. Um, if we use just a shadow, we actually still see a problem because in addition to having the sunlight, there's also a fill light kind of down and to the right. So on the bottom part of the ear, you still get that um, sort of rim effect, the powdered ear. But using spherical harmonic ambient occlusion solves it for you. Um, so the one other thing to keep in mind is that this is actually made worse by physically based shading. So with physically based shading, you tend to have these really um, bright specular highlights right at grazing angles, which is good because that's what real materials actually do. But then when you have um, self-shadowing artifacts where shadows aren't there, it actually makes the problem worse. So it's one thing to keep in mind. So it's better than nothing. Um, it's too expensive to use everywhere. It's pretty easy to use if you're forward. If you're deferred, it's gonna be kind of tough because it's nine channels. Um, okay, adaptive tessellation. Something that we've been saying that we we're going to have forever. Um, had a conversation in, I think in 06, where someone said, the PS3 is the optimal architecture for subdivision surfaces. And uh, that didn't quite pan out. Um, but we can actually do it this generation. So here's the top of his head. You can see sort of the uh, standard fastening artifacts? Well, we can adaptively tessellate just the, uh, the very silhouette um, triangles, and that will solve most of the issue. Here's what it looks like with everything um, tessellated. It's not a big difference. Similarly, we can do the same thing kind of under the chin. So this is with no tessellation. And then by adaptively tessellating the ones um, by the silhouette, we can fix that particular artifact um, and it looks very similar to doing the full tessellation everywhere. And so the rough times here is that with uh, tessellation being off, it took like 4.14 milliseconds for the whole scene, all in. Um, the adaptive version bumps it up a little bit, like 4.22, but tessellating everywhere takes like 6.18 milliseconds. It's gonna be hard to justify 
um, full tessellation, even in cutscenes on consoles, but I feel like the adaptive tessellation could work. And the way it works, of course, is that the little triangles in blue are the only ones that are actually being tessellated. The rest are being sort of going through the pass-through option. And this works because DirectX 11 is actually really nice and well-designed. Um, in the geometry shaders in DX10, it's pretty hard to actually do something useful with it because you have to like fix up all your little, little things. But the way DX11 is designed is that you can give each vertex um, some value for what its tessellation should be. Each vertex decides this based on how close it is to a silhouette. Then it takes, each vertex gets a little number, and then in your, uh, uh, in your const hull shader, you have to figure out what tessellation you want each edge to have. And as long as your tessellation edge function is commutative based on both of the vertices, you're guaranteed to never have any cracks. And so here's code you can look at later. And so just quickly, briefly talking about eyes. Um, eyes suck. Everyone complains about them. I, have, I, I can't tell you how many times someone has said, that looks great, except those eyes. Um, you probably had that too. Uh, for me, the big thing is getting ambient occlusion in the eyes right. That's the, the main thing that I want. And so the way you can handle this is fake out ambient occlusion for every single one of your poses. And then you can use ambient occlusion that looks kind of like that. I'm uh, over-exaggerating it here. But that's the, the basic idea. And then you can compress all 70 maps using, surprise, surprise, PCA. And then you can uh, drive those PCA weights using the Y channel of your eye joints. You can do the same thing for uh, teeth. So teeth is another one that people are always complaining about. And so the trick is the exact same thing. You bake out ambient occlusion. Um, instead of actually using true ambient occlusion, you imagine like a, uh, um, a plane in front of the head. It's like an area light. So you solve that offline, um, and then you can play it back. So here's the ambient occlusion on the teeth. You can see his mouth is kind of closed, so there's a little bit of light in there. Then as the teeth open, you get more brightening based on uh, how open the mouth is. And the nice thing is that you don't need any blending passes. Um, it's just one pass. It just works. Um, and of course, you can press all the maps of the PCA and drive it with the wire of the mouth joints. So that's basically the whole talk. Um, I'm a huge believer in the importance of diffuse animation, um, and it works. Uh, the one thing I don't like about the results that I got is that um, a lot of the data that's in the blend shapes is not actually being driven by the, uh, by the solver that I have. So that's one thing that I'm still kind of thinking about. Um, especially the wrinkles under the eye, they don't quite drive as well as they should. Um, and of course, in the real world, you're going to need some method to um, uh, adjust the meshes to some way. And we need better you know, tools to do that. If the art director says, you know, like, I want a more curvy nose, then you don't want to have to manually um, sculpt 70 different expressions one at a time. And he says, actually make it a little bit bigger. You have to go re-sculpt all 70 expressions. Um, we need better tools to figure out how to do this. Um, not really know what that solution is, but it's what we need to figure out. And so um, that's all I got. Um, I'd like to thank Infinite Realities for doing the 3D scans. Uh, Ramahan Falk did the character modeling. Uh, Mocap Militia with Vince Argentine. Um, Vince Argentine is the man. Um, somehow Matthew Mercer agreed to be the mocap talent. He's extremely talented. Um, and also I need to thank H.P. Uh, Decker, Maggie Bellamy, and Habib Zardapur. So that's it. Uh, 54 minutes. Great. Questions? <laughs> Any questions?